Hello, everyone. I am delighted to be uh, being able to share this time with all of you uh, as we discuss deconstructing personhood and standing. Before we get started, a few logistical notes. Uh, first, I'd like to give a special thank you to our platinum sponsors, the Brooks Institute of Animal Rights Law and Policy, as well as Carroll House Furniture. Uh, with their support, this panel is going to be deconstructing and discussing some of the weighty issues around animal status, personhood, what does it mean? What does it signify? Is it worth it? And we'll be digging into that. We'll also be having an opportunity to really get into a lot of questions and answers because this is an exciting topic. And the three of us has talked about it a lot amongst ourselves as whether with our fourth panelist who's joining us remotely, but we really want to hear from you. So we're going to try to streamline this process and make it as open for everyone as possible. The way this will work is as follows. If you are online, you have some sort of interface, you can use that to ask questions. Those will be transmitted to me. If you are not online, there are two microphones. Uh, once we get to the appropriate portion of this, you will see me reappear at this podium, approach the microphones, we'll get you involved in the conversation. And with that, we're going to begin. We're going to introduce ourselves to make that a faster process for you. And we'll begin with Karen Bradshaw, who's appearing via video. Hi, thank you so much for having me, AOLDF, and for moderating this panel, David. I'm honored to be part of this group today and happy to be joining you uh, virtually. So my name is Karen Bradshaw. I am a professor at Arizona State University, and I am also, also the author of Wildlife as Property Owners, A New Conception of Animal Rights, which is a book that came out in 2020 talking about the legal status of animals and how we can improve biodiversity outcomes through new applications of law. So specifically with regard to legal personhood, I was also the uh, co-author of an amicus brief on behalf of Happy the Elephant. Happy, as many of you likely know, was held captive at the Bronx Zoo. She still is, unfortunately, uh, but the Non-Human Rights Project brought a habeas corpus claim on behalf of Happy, which it was successfully appealed to the highest court um, in New York, the highest state court in New York. The case was heard and ultimately judges decided 5-2 that Happy did not meet the requirements for a habeas claim because she was not a person, legal or otherwise. But this very important piece of litigation introduced, I think, some justices and certainly members of the news media and general public to this idea of legal personhood for animals. And it was an honor to work on the brief and think about the arguments that underlie legal personhood just sort of taking stock of the field on behalf of a large group of law professors working and writing in this area. So today in my brief comments, I hope to just make a couple of points. Um, the first is to talk about legal personhoods, um, a brief overview, but also a discussion of its limitations, where it gets us and where it doesn't get us. And if that sounds somewhat negative, don't take it badly, uh, because I Think that legal personhood plays an important place in animal raw or an important role, but it's also not the only game in town. And the second argument that I'll make today is that perhaps legal personhood and our fixation on it is obscuring a larger revolution around interspecies equity, which is a place where time and talent and resources are being spent, but with much less attention and perhaps should be the subject of greater attention and resource expenditure because I think ultimately the two paths of legal personhood and interspecies equity end in the same place, which is improving the plight of animals in our legal system. So those are the two points I hope to make. I have just a few minutes remaining to rank them in. So we'll dive into this question of legal personhood. Legal personhood, as many of you know, is the idea that there are objects that are not recognized as persons in common parlance, which nevertheless have the legal status of personhood, meaning that courts and institutions recognize them as people or legal persons, even though they don't fit the conventional definition. So there is a number of writing in this area that stretches back for decades that notes that institutions have recognized ships and corporations as legal persons, even though you and I or sort of people on the street might not understand them in this way. 
And the argument goes that if we can give shifts in corporations and people who may not have the capacities traditionally associated with personhood, legal personhood, that perhaps too, we could extend those capacities, rights, obligations, et cetera, to animals. And so this is one line of thinking, perhaps if animals had legal personhood, their treatment might improve. And this has been the subject of litigation from a number of organizations, I think most notably the Non-Human Rights Project for a number of decades. And examples include freeing or um, at least rehoming in better conditions, animals that are sufficiently human-like to warrant legal notice of their contained and confined conditions, which is not in their best interest. So this is things like chimpanzees and orcas and elephants, highly intelligent creatures that are somewhat similar to human beings um, because they're cognitively, emotionally, et cetera, in a place where they can understand the confines of their condition. Now the limits of legal personhood are exactly that, right? We're confining what animals should matter to the law on the basis of their human-like ability. And I think this is wrong. I think categorizing animals and giving them merit based on anthropocentric characteristics is inadequate. That's not a sufficient basis for discriminating among groups of animals. Even if elephants and chimpanzees are more recognizably human-like, I don't know that that's an argument that they are subject to greater degrees of protection than other animals, which may be incredibly smart, sensitive, understanding, or valuable from a biological or ecosystems perspective, but not similarly human-like. So that's one of the many limitations of legal personhood. The other sort of major limitation as I see it, and this has certainly been recognized by others, is that many people fear a slippery slope argument. If we begin to extend legal personhood to animals, where does that end? Does that mean that veganism is widespread? If so, is that something that judges are willing to engage today? And many commentators think not. So the question is, given that legal personhood is at once the main thrust of the animal rights movement, but has also experienced relatively limited success in actual court litigation, what should we do? And I think that leads me to the second point, which is this idea of a larger revolution. I think legal personhood is one path to get from the status quo where we are today to where we want to go, to the broader idea of interspecies equity and a legal system that recognizes the rights of responsibilities, the rights of animals, and the responsibilities of humans to engage more thoughtfully with the more than human world. And so I'm interested in questions of legal personhood. I think it's important, it's timely, et cetera, but I see that as part of a much larger picture, which is sometimes less available to the public, sometimes obscured, because it's scattered across so many different sources and substantive areas of law, coming from local, state, federal, tribal legal systems, and also extending across areas of laws not typically thought of as animal law, like trusts and estate law or family law. So I encourage us today in our discussion to think about legal personhood, not in a vacuum, but as a broader conception of interspecies equity, which is both more palatable in the short term to judges, courts, legislatures, et cetera, but also escape some of these problems of speciesism, where there are anthropocentric characteristics of some animals entitle them to heightened protection, but leave other animals unprotected. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, my name is Macarena Montes. I'm from Chile, but I live in Barcelona. Um, I'm an attorney, but I've been doing research for the last seven years. Uh, but when I was an attorney, I worked at a law firm for seven years in the litigation area. So personhood uh, was always something very important because as an attorney, you're always representing persons in court. But also coming from a civil law country, from the first year of law school, we learned that the persons are a part of the highest category within the legal system. So we have, an, within the civil code, we have a whole chapter that is very long on the law of persons. So uh, as a researcher, I've, um, I, well, recently I finished my PhD that's titled Animal Personhood, A Legal and Moral Defense. Um, but also I have participated in drafting amicus briefs for three different cases. 
um, in Latin America that I'll speak in a couple of minutes. I'll talk to you about those cases. So I'm interested in as a research as a researcher in legal personhood, but also I'm interested in the legal aspects and how legal how legal personhood is evolving in especially Latin American case law. So the problem with legal personhood today, especially in civil law countries, is that we divide personhood into natural or physical persons and legal persons. So within the category of natural persons, we can find human beings and only human beings. And in the other categories, we can find corporations and those types of legal persons. So the problem with, with this is that the legal system is sustaining human uh, exceptionality and, and making humans uh, be forming part of the highest legal category and not allowing any other types of beings within the, that category. So that is a major problem with personhood because when we start thinking, okay, what makes humans so exceptional? Um, we start seeing that most of the characteristics that commonly appear like rationality, self-awareness, uh, emotions, relationships are characteristics that scientists like Lori Marino, for example, that spoke today about these things have widely uh, evidence that many animals possess. So um, my research um, and my thesis was important because a lot of legal practitioners, especially in the Spanish speaking world and particularly in Spain, even though they uh, may support animal rights or animal protection and are called call them themselves animal law attorneys, they oppose including animals in within the personhood category. And this is very interesting because they support animal protection, but they think that considering animals as person, as legal persons is going too far. And so we can see that even within the animal rights movement, we are still supporting the considering humans as these special kinds of beings. So within my, my research, I, uh, examine five common uh, definitions of legal personhood that appear in, in the law or in doctrine. And all of these definitions can include at least some animals within the definition. There is no argument to exclude animals. So these common definitions are personhood understood as a legal mechanism as something that anything that the law says is a legal person is a legal person. So anything could be a legal person that comes from Kelsen's uh, theory, then we have the concept of the legal person as the role or the status that a being or an entity plays within society. And this is the concept that comes from Roman law. And this is a very interesting concept that we don't usually use that much, but it could help us include other types of animals that have a very special role within our societies or even animals that have special roles within their unique societies. So then we have the typical textbook definition of legal personhood as the capacity to hold rights or bear duties. Then the other textbook definition of personhood as the subject of rights. And then the concept of legal personhood as a cluster concept. The thing that I defend is that animal personhood can be defended according to any of these definitions or even other definitions. And that supporting animal personhood doesn't require legal pr practitioners to, to have or support any weird theory or create a new concept of the legal person or invent a new theory of legal personhood. With what we have today, we can perfectly include at least some animals in these different categories. So my uh, position is having an ecumenical defense of legal personhood that can be defended from any theory or, from, or using any concept of the legal person. <clears throat> And I defend this because I think that as legal practitioners, and here comes like the practical aspect, when we have cases in court, it's good for us to have different concepts of the legal person because this gives us space to see, okay, in this case, I have, for example, a companion animal. Which of these definitions can get me closer to a recognition of animal personhood or to convince to convincing a court that this animal is a legal person? So maybe the concept of the role played in society 
could be a good uh, concept of the legal person for companion animals or for other animals that have this important role within our societies. And, um, and so I believe that having different de definitions instead of uh, saying, okay, I only defend this definition and we should use only this definition helps us uh, include more animals and have the possibility to have this space or margin to argue with judges and use dif different definitions depending on, on the case we have at hand. So for now this, five minutes, right? <laughs> okay. that, that was great. <laughs> but if you want to go into case detail, you can. Right now? Yeah. Instead of? Oh, we'll, we'll come back. Yeah, we'll do cases after. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we have so much to say to you. <laughs> Um, hi everyone, my name is Ariel Flint, and my views on personhood have been shaped by my role doing civil litigation at ALDF. And my job doing litigation for an animal rights organization means that a couple times a week, I get awful emails that describe new ways that animals are being mistreated. And usually I only get those emails because law enforcement has failed to intervene, either because they don't have the resources or the political will to make animal cruelty a priority. And then it falls to me and my colleagues to try to figure out if there's a way to file a civil lawsuit to protect the animals in that case. And usually that means we have to ask two questions. The first is whether the mistreatment of the animals is even unlawful at all. Because as we know, a lot of the awful ways that we treat animals in this country is not illegal. But usually we figure out a way to at least argue that a law is being violated. The second question is really the key, and it's the big challenge, which is even if a law is being violated, can we find someone who has the ability or the standing to enforce that law? Now, the Supreme Court has said that at least in federal court, you need to be the one who's injured by the conduct you're complaining about if you want to file a lawsuit. But courts in this country have, at least until now, not been, willing, not been willing to recognize that animals can serve as plaintiffs. And so what that leaves us is uh, we're in a situation where we have to scramble. Even though the misconduct, the mistreatment of the animals is illegal, we have to scramble and get creative to argue that a human over here was injured by the cruel treatment of the animal over there. And we try to get creative, we say, you know, maybe the human or an organization suffered an economic injury, or maybe they suffered an aesthetic injury by having to observe the mistreatment of animals that they felt a bond with. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of times it's too hard to do. And so the unfortunate reality of our legal system right now is that even though we have laws in place that say that animals should not be treated cruelly, and when we can prove that a law is being violated and that the animals are suffering, when law enforcement fails to intervene, and we, when we can't find a human who's coincidentally injured by the cruelty to an animal, the animals are left to suffer ongoing cruelty without any relief. And I think this vacuum in our ability to enforce cruelty laws and other laws that uh, protect animals is really an area where personhood can play a very important role. If we can pass laws or set precedent that allow animals to serve as plaintiffs, we can really go a long way to improving the lives of animals. And just taking a step back uh, to kind of grapple with what personhood really means, at least in litigation. And at ALDF, we define it in two buckets. The first is what we call procedural personhood, which is where we file a lawsuit and we're just asking the judge to recognize that the animal can serve as a plaintiff. And in procedural personhood cases, we're not asking to create a new right. We're only asking that the judge allow us to enforce an existing right in a way that we can't otherwise if the animal uh, can't serve as a plaintiff. There's another type of personhood case, which we would call substantive personhood cases. And that's the kind of case where you're asking a judge to create a new right for an animal like the right to not be held captive or to not be exploited for food in research. Both approaches and both types of cases, I think have their uh, potential and also their limits. I'm sure we'll be discussing some of those, 
But I think either way, we, we have to come to terms with the fact that personhood is a very diff difficult goal to accomplish. It's gonna take a long time to get there. And I think we have to be super calculated and take slow, steady, incremental steps. And we have to show patience. But along the way to personhood, I don't think we should be single-minded. It's not personhood or go home. There are other strategies that we've, de we've developed that have proven to be su a successful way to protect animals. And uh, maybe we'll be discussing some of those, but I think they're equally deserving of our time and attention. Thank you. Uh, so I'm David Rosengard. I'm a managing attorney at the Animal Legal Defense Fund. I'm on the criminal side of the house from, from Ariel's civil side. Uh, and a few things that I, I find it useful to bear in mind when we talk about personhood are, first and foremost, legally speaking, person and property are not opposites. I think we talk about them that way a lot in popular culture, but that's not how the law works. And we can see that in recent news. Uh, very recently, Elon Musk paid billions and billions of dollars for a person. That person is named Twitter. He now owns that person because Twitter is a corporation and corporations are people. You could be a person and be property. If you are a human, you are a person and not property. These are different concepts. The opposite of person is not person. The opposite of property is not property. And to me, this suggests a few useful things. Uh, one is that while it's useful, it may be interesting to talk about property in terms of what it means for animals legally. It may be misleading to see that as the end all and be all of answering questions about the legal beinghood of animals. Also to me, it suggests that personhood is non-atomic. And what I mean by that is personhood isn't one single indivisible thing. This is, I think, similar to the cluster concept you were talking about. Personhood is a category, a label that can be applied to different entities. And within that category, there are different types of personhood in the same way that fruit is a category, but apples and oranges are not the same thing. In terms of a, a guide to how we think about personhood, this is, this is a way I like to think about it. I see it really as about recognition ultimately as a legal entity. And the baseline is being legally recognized as somebody and somebody who counts legally. I think there's an argument that building beyond that, a stronger version of personhood is and someone who can do something about it. So you have the law recognizes you as someone, not a thing. Your somewhatehood counts and if you've got really good personhood, you can do something about that, like being a plaintiff in a lawsuit, if you as a being are being impinged upon. Currently, I would say animals are hovering somewhere around the someone, maybe they count, maybe they don't count category. And this is not something that is often explicitly acknowledged in the law. The law likes to talk about animals as things, but there are a variety of places where we can see that the law acknowledges the intuitive truth that I think we all recognize, which is animals are not objects. Animals are creatures, they're beings. As a criminal lawyer, I of course uh, find a, a lot of uh, utility in looking at animal protection law, which prohibits, broadly speaking, animals from being tortured, from experiencing egregious levels of suffering and so forth. There is no law against torturing a car or a chair or a table because those are objects and you can't torture an object. Objects aren't sentient creatures who feel. And so the law has already recognized in critical ways that animals are someone. And in fact, that these are someones who are entitled to being shielded from unlawful cruelty at human hands. We can have an argument about, about, about whether that should be a broader scope, whether unlawful cruelty should be expanded to cover more of the maltreatment that you were hearing about that is currently lawful. 
we can have discussions about whether animal is too narrowly defined. But there is already a recognition that animals are someone, and that means something in some places. And I point this out not to argue that everything is taken care of and we can all go home, because, oh, we've got so much more to do. I bring this up because one of the arguments you will hear, and you've heard it alluded to already, is the slippery slope concern, the concern that if animals are legally recognized, as entities, as persons, as someone instead of something, ah, the system will fall apart. The sky will fall, dogs will be voting, cats will be driving, who knows what happens next. And I'm here to tell you now that we crossed that Rubicon long ago. Animals are someone's and the law has already made that recognition at least implicitly. Now the task is to get the law to follow through on being consistent with that. I think this is a good time for us to talk about cases. Um, okay, so in Latin America, uh, I've, uh, I've researched around 38 cases on non-human animal personhood. Um, sorry, in, around the world. And most of those cases are in Latin America, especially in Argentina. So there are some trends that are interesting because um, these cases started out with chimpanzees in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, um, the people that filed these habeas corpus cases received criticism from the animal rights movement saying like, but that species is why only chimpanzees? But the thing is that those cases opened the door for many other animals. So now in Latin America, there are cases that recognize dogs, um, other types of primates, elephants, um, even an Andean bear as non-human persons or subjects of rights. And that's why I mentioned before that the concept of subjects of rights, uh, understanding the legal person as a subject of rights is a useful concept because in Latin America, many judges use legal personhood as a synonym of uh, the subject of rights. So um, for example, in Latin America, there, are, there was an important case in Colombia that reached the constitutional court that, that is the highest court in the country it started with a habeas corpus for an Andean bear. And the lower court in that case, uh, sorry, the court of appeals in that case, because of the system in it, in Colombia was the Supreme Court. That was the, the court of a, the Supreme Court in Colombia acts in that type of procedure as the court of, as a court of appeals in that process. So is, it is also one of the highest courts in the country. And the judge of that court recognized Chucho, the Andean bear, as a non-human person. And the judge did this linking Chucho to the environment because in Colombia, the protection of the environment is something very important. They recognize their constitution as a green constitution. So they, uh, the judge considered that if Chucho, the Andean bear, bear has some legal protection as a protected species inside Colombia, then he is a subject of rights. And so the judge granted the habeas corpus. At the end, the constitutional court uh, denied the habeas corpus. But the thing is that now in Colombia, everybody knows who Chucho the Andean bear is. So even if the, the case failed, everybody recognizes that that bear is Chucho. That bear that lives in the Barranquilla Zoo is Chucho. Chucho is an individual with a unique bio, biography and a unique personality. And the origins of the concept of person actually start like that, recognizing and funerary rituals uh, that the dead was a unique individual. So then we have other interesting trends in Latin America. For example, there are many cases where, where criminal law judges recognize the animal that has been, uh, for example, mistreated or treated with cruelty, or even, for example, one case was shot dead by a policeman. So the judge on his or her own motion recognize the dog as a non-human person and a subject of rights without the, the party saying, hey, this dog is a non-human person. The judge recognizes that in the judgment. And there's a very interesting case where a dog whose name was Tita was shot dead by a policeman because she barked at the policeman and so he shot her. And the criminal law judge recognized Tita as a non-human person, a subject of rights, and as the non-human daughter of the human who presented the criminal case. So the, the judges are starting to link the multi-species family with the non-human 
with non-human persons, with a legal person. And he recognized that this human was Tita's father and that Tita was a member of that family and so a non-human person. So that is one trend where criminal law judges are saying, hey, these animals are non-human persons. And then another interesting case that happened recently was Estrellita's case in Ecuador, um, which started with a habeas corpus. Estrellita was a woolly monkey that was confiscated. She, after living 18 years with a family, she was put in quarantine in a zoo and she died there a month later. So the, the human family filed a habeas corpus and the case reached the constitutional court who selected the case because the court said, well, this case is interesting and gives us a chance to talk about these issues that we don't, we don't really know anything about them. So the court was interesting, interested in knowing if animals could be considered as subjects of rights, if animals could be considered subjects of rights protected by the constitutional rights of nature that are part of the Ecuadorian constitutional, of the Ecuadorian constitution, and if the habeas corpus can be used for animals. And so uh, I worked on the amicus for this case with, uh, on, with Harvard, with the Brooks McCormick Jr. Animal Law Policy Program, with Professor Kristen Stilt, we worked on the rights of nature question, and the non-human rights project, uh, Stephen Wise and Kevin Schneider worked on the habeas corpus part. But the most important part was the rights of nature part, because it was an opportunity to incorporate individual animals in the protection of nature and that it means that animals would have constitutional rights if we managed to put them inside the rights of nature because those are recognized in the constitution so um i know i i'm talking too much but a couple of minutes it's so good you should keep going okay so the thing is that until this case it, usually when we talk about environmental law and protecting animals or even the rights of nature th these a, like theories or frameworks had always focused on protecting the species. So, and we all know that this protection hasn't really stopped the extinction of animals because at the end, environmental law allows us to keep using animals and kind of considers animals as natural resources. So it's like trying to maintain the species. So we wanted to argue that individual animals are protected by the constitutional rights of nature. And so, we told the court that a species is made up of individuals. That sounds really obvious, but it is. So when you start killing individuals, you obviously are affecting the species. So there are clear cases, for example, in Ecuador, there are regions in Ecuador that where there are only like 10 jaguars left. So if you start killing jaguars, you're gonna destroy that population pretty quickly. But we also argued that a, killing an individual affects the species even when we're talking about mm, species that are not in danger of extinction. So for example, woolly monkeys, which Estrellita was a woolly monkey, have a really hard time dealing with humans within their habitats. So when humans go into their habitat, like hunters, for example, they don't re reproduce as much. So obviously the population starts getting affected. But also when we start killing animals like hunting or when people poach animals, we, we're not really thinking who we're killing. We, we're, people are just saying like, doesn't matter if I kill this woolly monkey or this woolly monkey, it's just a woolly monkey, they're replaceable. But the thing is that they're not replaceable because they're, they're individuals, sentient individuals. So for example, if I kill a woolly monkey, I might be killing a mother that has different, for example, babies or young children, young children, sorry, young uh, woolly monkeys to care for. And so uh, those animals might die because the mother was killed. Yeah. Or for example, in, talking about other animals, for example, in, in, if we kill elef an elephant, for example, we know that elephant societies works, work with, there's a matriarch, you know, it's a matriarchy. So if we kill, for example, an elephant, we may, might be condemning a whole herd of, anim, of elephants to death because researchers have found that, um, for example, mature elephant, uh, elephants that have lived a long time and are in charge of a, a herd, remember uh, certain uh, places where they can get water and severe periods of drought. And, this, and so these types of elephants are very, it can save their whole herd. 
So what if I kill that elephant? I might be killing a whole herd because that elephant has the knowledge to save her whole community. And the same happens with many, many different types of animals, but we don't consider this. Maybe we're killing animals and living and leaving the ones that are alive are siblings, so they won't reproduce. So we are condemning the species. So, and finally, our, our, our final argument was to say that if the court didn't recognize animals as individuals protected by the rights of nature, so how many animals would activate or trigger the rights of nature? How many deaths? And that would put the court in a really tricky situation, but because the court would have to say, okay, maybe two animals, 10 animals, 100 animals, and the rights of nature are triggered. But that means that then killing a hunter could kill 99 animals. And so they're, that the hunter is saved from activating the rights of nature. So at the end, the court considered all these arguments and, 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 and recognized that all animals are subjects of rights, recognized that animals have different rights and ordered Congress to draft a bill on animal rights within two years. And that, that uh, bill is currently being discussed in the Congress in, in Ecuador. So we see the, that there are different trends in Latin America, but there are, very, there are huge advances in Latin America in these cases. Like, I don't know of any other case like Estrita's case in any other part of the world. So. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Well, that was amazing. <laughs> uh, this year um, at ALDF, we had two active personhood cases. And I think everything that Macarena just described is a perfect transition to one of the cases that we filed in the last year, because it really was born from our admiration of all the progress that animals and animal advocates like you have been making across the world. In Argentina, there have been 20 separate decisions that recognize the personhood of animals. There have been incredible decisions in Pakistan, in India, in Ecuador. And so we saw all of this, we were a little bit jealous <laughs> and we wanted to see if uh, there was a way that we could leverage the progress that animals were making abroad to help animals in the US. And also, you know, we wondered like a lot of foreign litigants, maybe the animals who are parties in foreign cases need evidence here in the US because we're a hub of information. And so we kind of put it together and we found this statute, 28 USC section 1782. It's a federal statute that says, if you're an interested person appearing before a foreign tribunal, you can come to the US and ask for permission to collect evidence in support of your foreign case. And what the Supreme Court has said is that if you're a party to the foreign litigation, you automatically qualify as a legal person under this statute. So it occurred to us, that if we could find an animal who is a party to a foreign case and who needs evidence here in the US, we could package a pretty compelling personhood case. And so that's what we set out to do. And we partnered with people like Professor uh, Rajesh Reddy from Lewis and Clark and Diego Plaza from the Interspecies Justice Foundation. And we started approaching these animal advocates, attorneys throughout the world who are representing animals and we just asked if they need anything in the US, any discovery. <laughs> uh, yeah, you'd be surprised, a lot of them do. And we ended up in Colombia, where 30 years ago, Pablo Escobar, who's a notorious drug trafficker, wanted to flaunt his wealth and he built a private zoo and he imported hippos. Like you do. <laughs> yeah. And then after his death, the government moved all of the animals off his property, except for the hippos. <laughs> Didn't know what to do with them. And then in the 30 years since, the hippos have escaped the property, infiltrated the local river system, overpopulated like crazy. Turns out Colombia is a paradise for hippos. <laughs> yeah. And uh, now uh, scientists are concerned that they pose a real danger to the ecosystem. And so the government began to consider a plan to kill the hippos. And that's when an animal rights lawyer and a law professor in Colombia filed the lawsuit on behalf of the hippos to argue that they shouldn't be killed if there's a non-lethal way to control their population. And the stars aligned for us because incredibly, there are two experts in Ohio who have expertise on non-lethal birth control of hippos. 
so we took this as a sign and we uh, put together a case. It's a discovery application that we filed directly on behalf of the hippos in federal court in Ohio. And we argued that under the Supreme Court precedent, because they're foreign litigants, they're interested persons under the statute. And we filed it and three hours later, the judge granted our request and the case was closed. And it's probably the fastest personhood case in history, if nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, the reason it worked is because we managed to flip the script of what a typical personhood case looks like. Because usually you're asking the court to go out on a limb and become the first to say that an animal is a person. Mm -hmm. And judges are really uncomfortable with that. And in this case, we were able to filter the personhood question through binding Supreme Court precedent. And so the court would have had to ignore binding Supreme Court precedent and actually go out on a limb to say for the first time that a foreign litigant is not a legal person under this statute. Uh, you'd have to really hate animals to reach that decision and to rule against us. And uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the potential implications of the case, but I, I think. If nothing else, I hope that the case ends up serving as a proof of concept because for so long, there's been personhood case after personhood case that hasn't been successful. And you start to worry that maybe animals are never gonna be able to go through the courthouse door. And hopefully what this case ends up doing is serving as a proof of concept that animals can have standing and that animals can be legal persons. Uh, the second active case that we had this year is the case of Justice the Horse, uh, which is actually working its way right now through the court system in Oregon. Justice was a horse who was severely mistreated, so much so that now he needs medical care for the rest of his life. And uh, in Oregon, there's a great Supreme Court decision, state Supreme Court decision, that recognizes that animals are themselves the victims of animal cruelty. And it's also well established. It's also well established that if you're a victim, you can sue your abuser for the cost of your care. And so we paired these two principles together and we filed the lawsuit directly on behalf of Justice the horse to try to recover the cost of his medical care that he's gonna need for the rest of his life. So it's, as I said, it's still working its way through the court system. A couple of months ago, we got a disappointing decision from the Oregon Court of Appeals. And I think as an intermediate appellate court, it was just uncomfortable grappling with some of these questions and advancing the law. Uh, to rule against, that, against us, it, it relied on centuries old notions that animals are purely property, they have no rights. And uh, in one part of, in its decision, it questions how we could even know that justice would want us to file a lawsuit, but I think it's fair to assume that justice would wanna be able to afford medical care. So, um, uh, we are going to petition the Oregon Supreme Court in the next month. And we're very hopeful that as the highest court in the state, they'll feel more comfortable grappling with some of these questions and hopefully advancing the law in a direction that helps animals. Thank you. And it's worth noting that for the hippo case in particular, you did a lot of the work putting all that together and getting the theory together. And I think that's that's important to underscore. So thank you for that. No, thanks. It was definitely a team effort within ALDF, Christopher Berry, Christina Cladis, and others. And of course, as I mentioned, Professor Reddy, Diego Plaza. So yeah. Movement succeeds. Absolutely. Um, so again, speaking from a criminal law perspective, you're going to hear me talk about crimes uh, and criminal cases. And I'll be focusing on a few cases that ALDF has weighed in on, we're typically weighing in on these either by filing amicus briefs or by offering support to one of the parties because criminal cases are the state bringing the case as the vindicating party against the defendant. The animal is, well, as we'll see, there might, they might be a victim and that might or might mean that they're a party. Hold that thought. Uh, but one thing that I also encourage you to bear in mind is this, and I think this is useful if we think about all of these cases, is personhood a means or a measure, or is it both? And what I mean by that is, 
do we look at personhood for animals as the way we improve the position of animals in the law? Or do we know that we've improved animals' position by the fact that they are getting more personhood? Or is it both of them, depending on the case we find ourselves in? Uh, so I'll, I'll start with the case out of uh, Washington State. Actually, going to be two Washington cases because they're great cases, and this is from the Pacific Northwest. Um, and the case that I'll start with is uh, State versus Abdi Isa. The, the facts, in short, are uh, a, a woman named Fairbanks. It's a seven-year-old Chihuahua Dachshund mix um, named Mona, and this is her beloved dog. Um, unfortunately, Mona and, and Miss Fairbanks are not beloved by the, the gentleman that Miss Fairbanks is in a relationship with, uh, and he ends up stomping Mona to death in a, an episode connected to domestic violence. Uh, and as this wound its way through the court system in Washington, a variety of issues arose. And my colleague, Kathleen Wood, who I can't see because the lights are blinding me, there she is, did heroic lifting on doing our amicus work around this. And I'm only going to focus on part of it relevant to the personhood question. And that really boils down to what might strike you with a strange query. Is domestic, uh, domestic violence connected animal abuse a victimless crime? Most of us would say no. But the Washington Appellate Court said, yes, it is a victimless crime. And the way they got there, I think really illustrates that you can be someone and not always have that count. So what the Washington Appellate Court said is, we have, a stat we have statutes that protect animals from cruelty, but we also have domestic violence statutes that don't allow animals to be victims for domestic violence purposes. And because animal cruelty is about protecting animals as someone's, and we're not protecting animals as property because you can't abuse your own animal and get away with it. So it's not about who owns the animal, it's about the animal, you know, as you said, as an individual, as themselves. Because the animal cruelty law protects that animal, Fairbanks, the woman who owned Mona, who had lived with Mona for almost seven years, wasn't a victim. And therefore, for domestic violence purposes, there was no victim at all. This is a great example of Mona, the Chihuahua dachshund, being recognized as someone, but paradoxically, because she was someone, not counting. This is not, as you could imagine, an answer that we, or Ms. Fairbanks, or the state of Washington were very fond of. So off we go to the Washington Supreme Court. Uh, the Washington Supreme Court overturned that appellate ruling. They said, of course, Ms. Fairbanks is a victim. The reason Mona got killed was to inflict emotional, psychological harm on Fairbanks as a means of leveraging and controlling her. And this is not uncommon in domestic violence scenarios. Animals are often threatened as a means of controlling human victims. And the Supreme Court said, animal cruelty is, can be a crime of domestic violence. We have a list in Washington state of domestic violence eligible crimes. Animal cruelty isn't on the list, but the list is not exclusive. It is crimes including X, Y, Z. And so the court said, if you kill a dog to control and harm your partner, of course, that's domestic violence. What about Mona, though? So, again, Mona was clearly excluded by statute from being a victim for domestic violence purposes. But interestingly, the court referred to her, referred to Fairbanks, Mona's owner, consistently throughout the opinion as a victim, not the victim. And in fact, in a concurrence, two of the justices wrote to say that they viewed their entire holding as being entirely separate from any question about whether animals were property, weren't property, or had any other kind of status at all. And the court did not venture forward to say that animals couldn't be victims in any other context. And this, I think, is really significant because it indicates that the court is saying, we know Mona, the dog, is someone. We know that she doesn't count for this statute because the legislature says in plain language, 
animals don't, but she could count in other statutes. And there's no reason to conclude that out of hand. And in fact, we see in some other cases that very thing happening. Uh, another Washington case, State versus Dahl, uh, which was initiated with the able work of Ann Finney. Uh, thank you, Ann, uh, who's a prosecutor in Washington, concerned the proportionality of a possession ban for animal cruelty. Mr. Dahl was convicted of cruelty. He was prohibited from owning animals. He said, this is disproportionate. Yes, I killed my neighbor's cat, but I'd like to own animals in the future. In walking through that opinion, one of the things the appellate court said is, the reason we have animal protection law is not to protect animals as property of their owners, but to protect animals as living, feeling creatures. And this court went on to explain that applied whether the animal was wild or tame, owned or undowned, domestic or non-domesticated. And that, that's a big deal. That's saying again, animals are someone and that someoneness counts for the purposes of having an entitlement not to be subject to unlawful cruelty. You're wondering, entitlement sounds a lot like a right. I think you're onto something. That might be a separate conversation, but I will absolutely argue that animals right now have the right to be shielded from unlawful cruelty. Uh, really quickly, a few more cases just to wrap up on uh, a piece that you heard about earlier. The Oregon courts have indeed held that animals are victims of animal cruelty and that under some circumstances, they can be crime victims, which gets us to that you are someone and it counts. Specifically, looking at state versus Hex, state versus Nix, state versus Hess, the holding there is that each individual animal victim counts as a victim for sentencing purposes. Uh, to give you a quick primer on merger law, doesn't that sound exciting? Merger law in, in crimes, normally if someone commits a crime uh, that has multiple of the same charge, all of that gets collapsed down to one at the end of the trial. It's why if you steal a six pack of beer from a convenience store, you could be charged with stealing six, with six counts of theft, one for each beer. But at the end of the case, if you're found guilty, it all collapses down to one count. If you apply this to animals, it would work the same way. And that's what the defense in both of these cases tried to do. They said, yes, I've been convicted of animal cruelty. Yes, this is 20 some charges, but there's only one owner. So really, that should just be one count of animal cruelty. Abuse one, get the rest free. And the court said, no, no, no. Because that collapsing only works if there's not separate victims. And every animal is someone protected by animal cruelty law, and they count as crime victims for that sentencing purpose. And that, again, is a significant issue for those animals. And it's significant because we're all still here being lawyers. The system hasn't fallen apart. Apparently animals can be someone and count, i.e. they can be persons and they can fit within our legal justice system. Uh, and I think with that, we're probably good for some Q&A. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I will apologize if I'm squinting to see you against the light, but uh, as I see, we have someone at the microphone. Hello. Apologies for that. Uh, uh, firstly, thank you for the presentation. It's very motivational. And particularly when you talk about international animal law, that's something super amazing in the stuff you did. So firstly, congratulations for that. My question is uh, in, in line of international animal law, particularly the hippos case. So this is something that I felt always very weird that in one country that this animal is, is a legal person and then it moves to another one and it's not. And uh, within that framework and given the different definitions you've given of the legal person, and uh, if you analyze a certain case, the definition used by a judge would definitely be different than the one we apply in the US which is really weird, but uh, I just wanted to ask 
in, in if you apply the non-binding principle, international principle of comedy in like states and, and when an animal is moving from one state where it is a legal person to one where it is not, can that be creatively used to make some case for legal personhood? So it's, I'm going to repeat that just to make sure that the echo isn't confusing us. It's if an animal is recognized as a legal person in one jurisdiction, one country, and moves somewhere where they aren't, what happens? Can we use that precedent? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. Well, <laughs> uh, for now, I, well, for example, in Argentina, Cecilia, the chimpanzee, was recognized as a non human person and a subject of right by an Argentinian court in Mendoza. And the court granted the habeas corpus and ordered her transfer to a sanctuary in Brazil. So in that case, they did respect that, uh, that judgment because Cecilia is currently living in a sanctuary in Brazil, in a sanctuary where she isn't forced to, they're not reproducing her or forcing or exposing her to the public. She's living her life in a, in a great ape sanctuary in Brazil. So in that case, you could see that that judgment did was respected in Brazil, but obviously her transfer wasn't the same as the transfer of a human person. So her transfer needed certain certificates and like seat, like the CITES certificate and all those documents that human persons don't have, but still that judgment was respected in Brazil. So there are cases where that is respected, but I do think that it is important to think about a, an, like an international recognition of legal personhood like the ones humans have. And it is a human right recognized in the Universal Declaration that our personhood is recognized wherever we go. So this is obviously something that we must work towards, but we can see in some cases that these cases have been respected and applied in other countries. I can think of a criminal hook that might get us there. The Lacey Act is a, it's a federal law in the United States designed to combat, among other things, wildlife trafficking. And one of the ways that operates is if someone crossing state lines, crossing tribal, federal lines, crossing lines internationally is illegally trafficking an animal, then they are liable for prosecution under the Lacey Act. If you have another jurisdiction that says, this animal is a person and that personhood means they can't be captured, they can't be exploited, they can't be maltreated in various ways. And someone illegally traffics that animal in violation of that finding of personhood, then I think we have a Lacey Act hook and now we're in federal court. And the DOJ has a lot of resources. This would be very exciting. Let me know if you find such a, such an international law, we'll talk. Can I add something? Yeah. There, there's another, another interesting thing. For example, I live in Barcelona and I live with two dogs and my dogs are Chilean, but they have a European passport and it's called the European Union Passport for Companion Animals. And that passport, for example, if I travel with them to Chile, Chile recognizes their passport and they can enter Chile again with that passport and they can come back to the European Union with their passport. And I can't do that because I am a Chilean citizen. So my dogs can travel easier like through the European yeah. Union to Chile, but I can't, you know, I have to, I don't have a European passport. So that's, for example, a specific case of companion animals having this very valuable document that we could argue that it recognizes some kind of legal personhood. Yeah, that's fascinating. Your dogs have a right of entry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi, um, my name is Kat Kelly. I'm currently a 2L at Lewis and Clark. So I am in Raj Reddy's Animal Legal Philosophy course. We've been talking a lot about personhood. And we recently read an article by David Faber talking about the concept of living property. Mm -hmm. um, just super quick for those who don't know, he's basically arguing that personhood is not the right direction. And what we should do is create a new category of property for sentient beings that would afford them additional rights to other property, such as right from freedom from harm to own property so that trust can be made in their name and so on. So what I've been grappling with ever since that reading is one, just 
what would the merits be of keeping something property? What do you guys think? But from a social perspective and like pushing progress just as quickly and efficiently as we can, I'm concerned, one, maybe there is benefits and it'd be expedited if we do create a new concept of property. But two, I think there's inherent bias in people to treat property worse or to restrict protections just off of the word, regardless of legal meaning. So would that be a danger in the personhood versus property argument? So it's, it's I'm glad you brought up Favor's construct of property plus, uh, because it's doing a few things. Part of the work that argument is doing is getting is operating within an assumption that personhood and property are inherently intention in favor of saying if you think you can't be recognized without being property i've got another option for you i think that another way to look at that is to say that per property plus would be personhood it just wouldn't be the kind of personhood that david favor is having that conversation with. I think he's having a conversation with a kind of maximalist personhood that says, if animals have personhood, that looks and feels more like human personhood, as opposed to the kind of the cluster concept that we've been talking about. Um, it might also be interesting to consider that animals may already be a kind of property plus, not to the extent that favor lays out. Favor lays out the notion of animals having equitable self-ownership, which gives them a whole range of additional rights. But again, animals currently have unique property rights that other kind of property don't have. There is no other kind of property that you cannot torture, that you cannot subject to illegal suffering. Um, as for whether the property status is a barrier or not, First, I would say that I, I would encourage people to think of that question separately from personhood. For me, at least, you could talk about is property status good or bad? And you could talk about what do we do with personhood? And those are different dials you can turn. Uh, I'm not convinced that property status is inherently legally bad. I think you are absolutely correct that there is a cultural bias towards people doing what they want with property. But I also think we can pass laws and say, you can't do what you want with this kind of property in various ways. Some of the utility is um, animals being recognized as property means that you can avail yourself of laws to separate animals from unhealthy situations more easily than you might if they were analogous to, say, human children. Uh, it is a much more involved legal process to remove a human child from a fundamentally unhealthy home than to remove an animal from a fundamentally unhealthy home. We could staff up a national program of animal housing welfare, and maybe we can get around that. But right now, the best option is dealing with it as a property issue. Just want to add that I hate the word person. I really think it gets in the way of protecting animals because people well, in judges, society reflexively reacts and rejects the notion that animals can be persons because we so often just associate personhood with being a human being. Um, so I think wherever we can, we should embrace maybe a move away from talking about animals as persons and just describe the same concept using different words. Maybe if we're passing a law, we just omit the word person in communications campaigns. But I think also the reality is for those of us who do litigation that uh, to some degree we're stuck with the word because it's the word that is in all of the statutes. Basically, if you wanna use the statute, you have to be a person. And in common law, there's, it's just like every case says, if you wanna use this cause of action, you have to be a person who was injured by the conduct. So it is what it is. <laughs> Can I add some? So many well not many but several civil law countries have modified their civil code to which recognizes animals as things or movable property or movable things and have said okay animals are sentient beings for example portugal colombia spain and other countries have gone this this way and that's kind of similar to what 
uh, Professor David Paper is saying, like, so animals are, are like a recognition that animals are like this special type of property or a, a sentient property or something, because even though the civil codes recognize animals as sentient beings, the rules of property still apply to animals. So nothing really, the, like their legal status or how they can act within the law doesn't really change with, with those with those changes, you know, but uh, when Latin America, they've used the concept of person or a judge has recognized the animal as a non-human person, that animal in some cases has managed to be transferred by, from a horrible situation in a zoo to a sanctuary. So it is obviously difficult to argue for personhood. And it's because we have this, like, a lot of people think that person means humans when it has never been the same as human. If you trace the history of the concept, it has never been a synonym. We have accepted throughout history, for example, theology has always believed in non-human persons like angels, God, the devil. Um, when people think about Superman, for example, or E.T., or, they're thinking that those are non-human persons. But but in the law, when somebody says, okay, an animal is a person, like people get really scared of it. But then those same lawyers that are scared are sometimes saying, oh, but the legal person is just a legal category. But then when we say, okay, so an animal can be a legal person, it's like, no, 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 that's too much. And no, only humans can be persons. So what's so what they're saying is that actually the person isn't just an instrument or a legal category, that there's something, there is ethic, something metaphysical behind the concept of the legal person. And that's why uh, concepts like dignity, rationality, uh, autonomy, agency, self-awareness, self et cetera, have been linked to the concept. But there's no clarity because sometimes people just say, oh no, it's a legal category, whatever. But then when we talk about animals, oh no, no, it's something much more. So there's not really any agreement on what it is, but the important thing is that even if we use like the, the concept of person as something metaphysical, like something that so, some entity that has rationality agency, animals can be persons according to that. And that's why science is so important because there are a lot of scientists that have already proven that animals are rational, that animals, that many animals can uh, recognize themselves, that many animals have uh, are part of complex societies or have relationships that have uh, complex emotions, et cetera. So whatever definition we use of personhood, we can put, consider some animals at least within that. And I think that, well, if we don't, if we always consider that only humans can be persons, I don't think that the protections of animals will reach the level we really want to reach, reach like the, this utopia maybe. But if we only consider that humans are persons, animals are always, their interests are always going to be subdued to human interests. I think we have to include some animals within the same category, legal category as us. So they're, they're like the debates on the, the rights they have can be more equal or have more chances in court. And I, I'm going to add just two things very briefly because your question makes me think of them and I think they're important. And one is, I think it's important to acknowledge that there are very good reasons why lawyers, judges, and society as a whole get very nervous when we talk about personhood and property. America has a really nasty history of depersoning humans and propertizing humans. And we should insist that every human is a person and every human is not property. That's what we do with the human side of the property lever and the personhood lever. For animals, we should be able to recognize that we can have animals be someone's that count and have that be self-enforceable in various ways, i.e. be legal persons, whether or not they are property. And that that isn't a reflection on humans. Again, I think there's good reasons why it scares people because our history there as a country, as a society, as a legal system, oh, it is not good. When you talk about animals, when you talk about persons crossing jurisdictional borders and suddenly not being persons, I can't believe that. I suspect I'm not the only person in this room who thought of the Dred Scott case, an infamous case where a freed former slave was re-enslaved on the argument that being in a, in a state that didn't recognize slavery 
didn't grant him his freedom. Um, but I think that we can't allow that history and the importance of humans being non-property people to prevent us from having good arguments and good conversations about animals. Awesome, thank you, that was amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Ben. I'm a student at Harvard Law School. And my question is about rights of nature based theories of personhood, like we see in Ecuador that operate around the nexus between an individual animal and an ecosystem. My question is what happens when we remove wild animals from their natural settings? Does that undermine their arguments for having personhood if they are held in captivity or as companion animals or in research? Um, okay, so in the amicus brief we filed in Ecuador, we didn't want to limit the animals that could be protected by the rights of nature to only wild animals. So we usually talked about animals in general and then talked about specific examples regarding, for example, woolly monkeys, but we didn't want to limit that. And the thing is that <clears throat> the, um, the court ordered Congress to, to draft this law on animal rights in general. And the law, the draft includes all animals and recognizes that animals are protected by the rights of nature and includes all animals. And the interesting thing is that there's a recent case in Ecuador where, um, well, so it's a uh, well. The case started because there was this uh, like this most wanted guy. They were looking for him in in Ecuador because he was like a drug lord, and so he faked his death. And they finally caught him in Ecuador, and he, they arrested him for money money laundering, and they confiscated all of his things. But his wife was also under investigation, and they confiscated everything she had in her house too, eh, including her companion animals. So she was under house arrest and she filed a habeas corpus on behalf of her animals. And the, the judge that, that got this habeas corpus said that companion animals are protected by the rights of nature in Ecuador and that companion animals cannot be treated as movable property because they have constitutional rights and granted the habeas corpus and like uh, reprimanded the, the authority for confiscating those animals saying like obviously you should have confiscated the cars not the animals like why did you do that and ordered the all that like that age governmental agency that's the one that confiscates things and then takes care of the things during the trial order them to read the constitutional court case and Estreita's case so they can understand that anim all animals are subjects of rights protected by the rights of nature. So there, there's already one case in Ecuador where the rights of nature have said, yeah, companion animals are also included. So we're crossing our fingers that there will be other cases where um, other types of animals, like maybe farm animals are included as well, but we have to see what, what happens. Thank you. University of Toledo's College of Law. I was curious if in cases where animal cruelty isn't getting prosecuted heavily or where um, it isn't a crime in certain counties, let's say, um, have you ever seen criminal damaging charges used instead? Or in the case of the domestic violence thing, doing an aggravated criminal damaging? So I'm gonna read that back to you so you can tell me if you're correct, because again, we're, we're having echo problems. So the question is, in places where animal cruelty isn't being prosecuted by the state, uh, is there a civil option to go after damages as a result of the criminality? Um, charging it as a criminal damaging ah. in the criminal system still, but using okay. it as, or like classifying them as property in that aspect instead of personhood. Obviously that undermines the whole personhood argument. <laughs> so, So I'm pausing to try to avoid going off on a much on a whole separate presentation about the history of victim rights and who gets to run prosecutions in America. So I'm going to try to condense that. My apologies to my students who have heard this many times. Uh, so once upon a time, private parties could prosecute their own cases. If someone did a crime against you, you would go hire an attorney to prosecute the case. That changed over time. 
uh, the state monopolized prosecution. So at this point, it would be in many states, it would be difficult to file your own criminal case. Um, there are some options, and you heard about one in the last presentation, uh, the Pennsylvania case, Man Look, where you can file a motion requiring the prosecutor to show their homework, to demonstrate why they didn't take the case, um, and to basically stand up and say either, I don't want to take this case because I don't like animals, I don't want to fight for domestic violence victims, whatever, or I didn't take the case because I didn't think there was a legal basis for it. And then the judge will say, the law is bad. You should read the, go back and read some more, go forward and move the case. Um, I think that's as close as you'll get in most places to a private prosecution, with the exception of Ohio for misdemeanor animal cruelty, where humane society, nonprofit humane societies can hire private attorneys to prosecute misdemeanor cruelty cases. Um, other than that, I think you'd be constructing some sort of civil damages because of a criminal action argument. Um, and then we're closer to the justice of horse case. Thank you. Do we have time for one more? That, well, one more. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Hi, my name is Olivia. I'm a 3L uh, law student at Suffolk University in Boston. Uh, so I wrote my paper this past summer in environmental law on non-human animal standing. So this was a great uh, lecture to watch. Uh, so my question was uh, in Sierra Club v. Morton, the Justice Douglas had the amazing dissent about that the public should be able to bring uh, cases on behalf of non-human animals or the environment. And I'm just wondering if you can clarify the difference between making uh, animals have legal personhood versus allowing the public to bring a case on behalf of an animal or uh, the environment. Uh, I just talked about in my yeah. paper about having to have a specific injury in fact on the human to be able to bring a case when an animal is being injured. Yeah, I'm just taking notes so I don't forget <laughs> while I start talking. I think that's an amazing question. I think if we can find solutions that don't require us to pose the personhood question to courts and we can find uh, equally efficient ways to protect the animal, that we should embrace it. Uh, this year, actually, we had a groundbreaking victory at ALDF where uh, we filed a lawsuit on behalf of a Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, which is just a specially incorporated NGO in California. And we filed the lawsuit arguing that the SPCA has standing to protect animals. And so we sued a puppy mill. And uh, we did so even though the SPCA hasn't suffered an injury, which you typically need uh, to have standing to file a lawsuit. And uh, this year, the California appellate court said that we were able to do that. And that to me, even though it's an organization filing a lawsuit on behalf uh, or to protect animals, that to me is uh, equally groundbreaking and advances the law in favor of animals as much as a personhood decision does. At the same time, I think that uh, there are some inherent limitations maybe with having organizations file lawsuit on behalf of animals in that probably, I don't know, I don't wanna say something that'll hurt my arguments in the future, but organizations, it just seems to me maybe their ability to file lawsuits to protect animals will be limited to requests for injunctive relief, like stop the cruelty, which is fine. But uh, what we're trying to do in the Justice the Horse case, and I think what comes more naturally when you file the lawsuit on behalf of an animal, is that you can request damages. And once you uh, establish that you can get damages for animal cruelty, I think that's when you start to have a deterrent effect. Right, the same way, in, in, that's how tort works. Generally, the availability of uh, product liability suits keeps us all safer because manufacturers don't wanna face lawsuits. And so if we can uh, one day have it that if you commit cruelty to an animal, you're gonna get sued and it's gonna affect your bottom line. I think that'll uh, uh, regulate behavior and protect animals. So two, two final thoughts there. Three, because first I'll say, should certainly read Sierra Club versus Norton. It's an important case. The dissent is heartwarming. 
It's about standing for rocks and stones and trees on the forest. It's love life. Second, when we talk about personhood, we've been talking about animals, but there's no reason that has to be limited to animals. There are long traditions throughout the world of societies, cultures, systems of governance and law that recognize rivers and environmental features, for example, as someone, as effectively persons. You can have personhood under those auspices for those features in the same way that a corporation is not a living creature, but it's still a person. Uh, as for why, what would a, a difference be between bringing suit on behalf of a river or a puppy versus the puppy or the river bringing it themselves? I think one answer is that the damages go directly to the victim. Uh, for example, I, I'm fortunate enough to share my life with a, a delightful half Frenchy, half English bulldog, am staff puppy mill rescue. He suffers a number of medical maladies because of the neglect he suffered at the puppy mill. He's going to be a ball of medical bills for the rest of his life. That's fine. We love him all the more. But were he to, were I to sue the puppy mill and win, that money would come to me. If I pass away, if something happens, that money goes wherever my estate goes. If Puck, my dog, sues, that money goes to him in a trust. And if I die, it would follow him to his next person. And similarly, if a river sues in the river's own name, you get a trust for that river instead of the money going to a nonprofit that loves the river, but it's not the same as the river. Great, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you all. <laughs>